1963. Remember the date? February 18th. That's I was 18. Thing. You were 18 years old. I was 18 years, one month, nine days old. Uh, why did you enlist? I wanted a career in the military. Had you always wanted a career in yes. the military? Yes. So that had been a goal all along? That was pretty much of a goal. So, uh, had you graduated from high school yes. already? Yes. What branch of the service did you say you joined? The Army. Why did you pick the Army? It seemed to be the most military of all the services. Do you recall your first days in service? Basic training. Well, first of all, when you uh, where were you inducted? Uh, Boston. It would have been Boston Naval Shipyard. And how long did you stay there? Oh, a matter of a day. Okay, just for the induction. Just that was just in, that was just induction. That's all. And then they sent you immediately. They to they sent me off to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And what was that like? It was interesting. It uh, was the first time I'd been away from you know home for quite some time. Uh, got to meet a lot of different people. Uh, you know, different races, different religions. Uh, very, you know, very. It was a very varied group. Everything and from your basic white Anglo-Saxon Protestant to uh, what I'm sure was a voodoo doctor from Jamaica. Um, how long was basic training? Twelve weeks. And uh, what kinds of things did you do in basic training? Oh. Basic military skills, uh, patrolling tactics, uh, close order drill, physical training, uh, army terms, terminology. Was it both in the field and classroom? Both. Instruction? Do you remember any of your instructors? I can't think of any names, no, but I can picture them. You can? I can definitely picture them. Do you have any memorable experiences from basic training? Probably the gas chamber is probably the most memorable event of, of uh, okay. basic training. What was that? Uh, we were all put in a, well, out in a field. The whole company was lined up and we were told to take off, you know, keep our gas masks off until we got a, a hit with the uh, tear gas. And they said, don't run. Well, about the time that gas hit everybody, everybody took off. Everybody was off running through the woods, and we had guys knocked out from running into trees. But it made a, it made a, uh, a lasting impression on me. And whenever I went to the field in Vietnam, I made sure everybody was carrying at least one tear gas grenade. It made a definite impression on this boy. Wow. Did you run? Oh, I, yeah, yes, I did. I was, I was, I was, I was, I was, oh, had it on, took it off, put it back on. It's, I was probably leading the pack in the, of the runners. Uh, any other memorable experiences from basic? Uh, I think uh, it was the, to tell you the truth, it was the first time I'd ever had any involvement with uh, black people. Uh, my high school, Lowell, was uh, a very big school. It would have two, three hundred graduating class. And the whole time I was there, I think there were four blacks in the school, and two of them were related. And uh, I remember going, I do remember going to Fort Jackson and seeing the biggest billboard I'd ever seen saying, Welcome to the home of the KKK. That's a, and that was my first. First impression at all of uh, you know any bigotry, but didn't find it in basic. No. After your twelve weeks in basic, did you have graduation? Yes. And what was that ceremony? Like? There was just a marching by a reviewing stand on the way to a bus taking you to your next base. 
Now, at that point, do you have any rank or no? No, I think I might have been a private E2 at the time. After graduation from basic, where did you go? I went to uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia for Advanced Infantry School. For how long? Uh, let me think. I believe that was another 12 weeks. And what was that like? Well, it was the, the company that I was in was all airborne volunteers, all people who were going to uh, jump school, except for one poor guy. I remember his name, Otero. He was a uh, Puerto Rican, about four foot nothing. And he found out about halfway through, uh, halfway through the school that everybody was going to jump school. And he was not going to jump school. He had never signed up for it, never volunteered for it. And I remember him running to the first sergeant to make damn sure that he wasn't, uh, he wasn't sent off to any jump school. Uh, as a matter of fact, the reason he was in the Army was his wife had turned him in for something or other, and it was a choice of being in the Army or being deported or whatever. But, uh, but everybody he was, that was memorable. Volunteer? Everybody else was a volunteer you for jump school. You volunteered for jump school? Yes. You wanted to be airborne? Yes. Now, advanced infantry training, is that different mm. than jump school? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's... Everybody would go through, not everybody, but everybody who was going to the infantry would go to advanced infantry training. And it was just basic patrol tactics, um, or in my case, uh, I was trained as a mortarman. That's MOS 11C. And what did a mortarman do? Uh, well, I don't know if you know what a mortar is. It, it, you learn how to set up and operate uh, mortars. It was interesting. It was very interesting. Uh, I've got to say, it was. Did you get to choose hmm. that, or did they just? Assume oh no, that? I was told that's what I was, I was going to do. Oh, so that became your special. Right. Uh, what other things did they teach you in advanced infantry training? Uh, again, basic patrol tactics, um, communications, uh, map reading. Uh, of course, always close order drill, uh, medical training, first aid type stuff. And that's, you know, military customs and courtesies. Do you have any memorable experiences from your advanced infantry training? Yes, as a matter of fact, the, the company I was in was extremely small. I don't know if it was, I think it was because it was before high school graduation. And there were only, I think, 20 people in my platoon, and maybe 100 in the entire company. And that's less than half of what a normal company would be. So we got to be a, a fairly tight group of people, and everybody knew everybody else, even if you weren't in the same platoon. Uh, and I remember, I remember specifically my, my drill instructor was uh, extremely sharp, uh, always uh, with starch fatigues. Uh, it, it impressed me. After advanced infantry training, where did you go? I went to jump school at uh, Fort Benning. Benning? Benning. Benning? And where's Fort that? Benning, Georgia. And how long did that last? Uh, jump school itself is only three weeks, and I was there for about, you know, we were waiting for the school and whatever, maybe four or five weeks. And was that strictly in the field practicing jumping? That was everything. It was a lot of physical training, uh, ground school, then uh, tower week where you jump out of a tower and you're suspended on. Um, cables, just teaching you how to exit an aircraft, and uh, they take you up in a great big, you know, big tower and drop you with an already open parachute so you can get used to guiding the parachute. And then the last week, the third week is jump week, where you make five parachute jumps and get your uh, get your wings.
And you got your wings. And I got my wings. And I happen to know, I didn't know him, but it turns out one of the drill instructors was from Lowell. I didn't know him and I can't remember his name. But uh, he managed to get me to go to uh, the ranger school, which was right there at Benning. So you immediately so went, I immediately from, drum went from drum school to ranger school, which was very unusual. That was, uh, um, it was either 12 or 16 weeks, I can't remember. I vividly remember the last two weeks, but I'm not real sure about uh, exactly how long it was. Now, when you went to jump school, did the whole company that you were with at Advanced Infantry Train go with you? Did you go with right, the they, no. Everybody, well, we all, all went at, at the same time, uh, not really so much as a, as a, a unit. Uh, and during the jump school, we'd be separated into different companies in jump school. Because there were other people coming from different places going. So, what was ranger school like? The best training I ever got. Your career in the military? Oh, yeah. It was the best training you ever got? And it was brutal. A lot of physical training. Like what? Oh, calisthenics for an hour or two every single day. Uh, you make a mistake and you're doing, you know, you're pushing the earth away from you. You're doing push-ups, uh, running around the building, uh, carrying, you know, a backpack full of sandbags, things like that. They, they kept you, kept you going and I, I, very, uh, very physically strenuous and mentally it was uh, tough too. You didn't get an awful lot of sleep. You did have a lot of classroom work, because a lot of it was uh, uh, map reading, uh, intelligence gathering, uh, photo reconnaissance type things. And then in your last, uh, last two weeks, they take you and drop you in the middle of uh, the Everglades, and you're, you have, you're in a maybe, let me think, might have been an eight-man team and everybody takes a turn at being the team leader and you have specific objectives to reach during the uh, during the two weeks and uh, they lie to you they tell you you're going to get food if you well they don't really lie they'll tell you that you're going to get food if you successfully uh, ambush a convoy and they'll throw off a sea ration case to you well, they'd do that, but inside the case would be one packet for eight guys to eat. The average weight loss was like 16 pounds in the last two weeks. And it was hot, you were always wet, you were always tired. But every day they changed the instructor. You know, a new fresh instructor came in. So, uh, you know, they were, they were fresh, but, you know, we were beat. But, uh, and it was, and, after that two weeks, guys had come out of the uh, come out of the field, and the first thing they'd hit is the vending machines, and just wipe them out, uh, and just any kind any kind of sustenance. I mean, to the point of being sick, eating to the point of being sick. You know, your stomach is about that big by the time the two weeks is over. But the training was outstanding. A lot of survival uh, training, uh, how to live off the land. So I take it you survived and became a ranger? I survived and became a ranger. Now what's your rank when you're a ranger? You when, I, go up? when I came out of there, I was an E5. Anyone who graduated, any enlisted man who graduated in the top, I think it was 5% of the class, was automatically promoted to uh, Sergeant E5. Okay, so that's a Sergeant E5? Right, three stripes. Do you know what year or month this was? Oh, then? I can't give you months. Uh, that would have been uh, 64. Where the very beginning of 64, uh, as a matter of fact, because I know I went to special warfare, the special warfare school, um, graduated from that in 60, about mid-65, and that was about a year and a half 
So it would have been early 64. Where did you go after Ranger School? I went to the Special Warfare School at uh, Fort Bragg. And where is that? Uh, North Carolina. How long were you there? Uh, eight, about 18 months. And that was all Special Forces. Right. That was all Special Forces training. And what was that like? A lot of classroom. Matter of fact, I'd say probably 85% of uh, Special Warfare School is, is classroom work. Uh, and I was being trained as a communication specialist. Your choice or theirs? Uh, my choice. So what kinds of things did they teach you? Oh, use and repair of various radios, various field radios. Uh, again, map reading, uh, strong emphasis on intelligence gathering, uh, patrol tactics, and how to, uh, actually, actually most of it was how to teach. People don't understand that special forces are teachers. They're not, not Rambos. That's uh, the commando type operations are a very, very small part of uh, special forces. Now having said that, that's what SOG is, the Special Operations Group. But generally, the basic special forces are teachers. We have 12 man teams, uh, two communication specialists, two weapons specialists, two medics, two intelligence, uh, two engineers, and two officers. And your idea is to be with uh, indigenous forces, just like Afghanistan is a perfect example. Those guys in Special Forces in Afghanistan are teaching the Afghans how to uh, fight a counter, a counter guerrilla war. And that's, that was the original idea of Special Forces. And most of Special Forces in Vietnam did that then from A camps. Did you know back when you were in the Special Warfare School that you were being groomed for Vietnam? Did you know? Oh, you you, oh well, absolutely. I mean, you, I volunteered for it. I mean, it, all of us did. Uh, you just knew that was where you were going with, without even volunteering. The only volunteering I did was for SOG, the Special Operations Group. That's where I wanted to go. How big was your class in Special Forces? Oh, it, it's kind of hard to say uh, because depending on what you were being trained for, intelligence or medics, medics took uh, almost two and a half years to train. Me, it took a year. In communications, uh, weapons, it'd be about uh, a year. Uh, intelligence, uh, not quite a year. So you really weren't in a one specific group. You know, you'd have guys graduating months before you did or months afterwards. Uh, I'd say in any given month that uh, there was a graduation, there might be oh, 30, 50, 30, 50 guys per month graduating. Not many. Do you have any memorable experiences from your special forces training? Uh, again, the last part of it, uh, well actually through the whole thing is the camaraderie of the, the guys who were there uh, and the intelligence. You definitely had people who uh, were more well educated than the average soldier by a couple of years. Uh, uh, definite a sense of, uh, a sense of duty. Uh, again, general cohesiveness. Uh, the one thing I do remember was the last two weeks of uh, what's called an FTX, field training exercise. You're parachuted into uh, part of uh, North Carolina and you've got to link up with different people. And anyway, on my jump I had all of the communications equipment with me. 
from my reserve chute down to my ankles was equipment. And fortunately, I was the first one out the door, so I didn't have to walk it from the back of the plane up to the door to get out. I just grabbed hold and, and leaped. And I remember when I turned it loose and hit the ground, there was nobody real close to me to help me carry this thing, and it weighed. It had to be 100 pounds worth of stuff. So uh, that, until I ran into somebody within a half an hour or so uh, to help me carry this stuff, it was, I was lugging it through this cow field. We jumped into a cow pasture, and you know what's in a cow pasture, aside from the cows. And uh, I remember dragging that through the cow pasture, and it was, uh, it was a pretty nasty bag by the time I finished with it. Special Warfare School? I went to the 3rd Special Forces Group right there at, uh, at Bragg and I was only there for a, for a month or so before I got orders to Vietnam. What did you do in that one month, do you think, that you were there? Actually, not an awful lot. The third at the time was kind of a holding group for uh, people who were they, they, people who were obviously going to get orders to go somewhere, uh, either to Vietnam or to one of the uh, the operational groups. So it was just a. So you were basically waiting. Basically you waiting. To go to you, it was a it was a wait and see operation. When you uh, got your orders to Vietnam, you knew that you were going to be a communication specialist at that point? I knew that's what I was trained as, but I didn't know how that was going to work when I went to SOG, because SOG is different from what normal Special Forces was doing in now, Vietnam. Had you already volunteered for SOG? Yeah. So uh, the only, that's the only way you went to SOG, is to oh. volunteer for it. Okay, so you knew you were going to be in a SOG unit somewhere? Right. You didn't know specifically. Specifically where, I didn't know. There were three places where there was SOG in North, Central, and South uh, Vietnam. And the SOG is your main unit. And that's broken down into Command and Control North, Command and Control Central, Command and Control South. Uh, innocuous names because we didn't want the press knowing what we were doing. As a matter of fact, SOG, Special Operations Group, was renamed shortly after it was formed to the Studies and Observations Group with the idea that being a nice innocuous thing and nobody will question that, but if it's a Special Operations Group, somebody's going to be asking, what special operations? And all our operations were cross-border operations in Laos, Cambodia, North Vietnam, Thailand. Did you uh, know that prior to going to Vietnam? Yeah. Yeah, I knew. Do you remember <laughs> your first impression in arriving in Vietnam? Hot. Do you remember the, uh, so what year do you think that was? 64? That would, no, that was six, uh, beginning, that was 65. About mid '65. Where did you land? Uh, Saigon. Flew from Washington, Washington State, to uh, well, actually went to Hawaii, and then I think it was a. No, we went to the Philippines. Yeah, went from Washington to Hawaii, to the Philippines, and then to Vietnam. That was the first time, anyway. So the your other, first impression was hot. Hot. What else? Uh, I was kind of, for some reason, I seemed to be impressed with the fact that uh, everything was in color. Uh, I don't know if for some reason, maybe the news accounts that I'd seen were black and white, but uh, everything was very, uh, very colorful for some reason. It just, uh, that struck me. I expected. I don't know, I expected everything to be uh, OD green, I guess. <laughs> Where did you stay once you landed? 
Oh, I was sent immediately up to uh, Natrang. That's 5th Special Forces Headquarters. Where is that? Natrang. N-H-A-T-R-A-N-G. Yeah. And don't ever use that in a spelling bee because I'm not real sure if that's exactly right. I'll check it. <laughs> um, how long were you there? Um, was that your home base then? No. No, that, that was home base for the conventional Special Forces troops. That's where headquarters 5th Special Forces was. 5th Special Forces was the Special Forces group that was assigned to Vietnam. Uh, let's see. Uh, we had about uh, we had about two weeks, if I remember, of uh, kind of indoctrination uh, out on one of the islands uh, off the coast of uh, Natrang. Uh, getting you used to patrol tactics in in a jungle and mountains, uh, classes on Vietnamese culture. Uh, anyway, again, a fair amount of classroom type stuff. We, uh, other, uh, unlike conventional troops, we weren't thrown into a frontline unit. You were uh, you were trained. In, in basics of how to deal with the populace. And that was something indigenous to uh, special forces where we, we worked with the people, not against them. Uh, you'll, and you'll note there's a big difference between the way conventional troops treated the popula population and the way they were treated by special forces. A vast difference. After your two weeks there, where did you go? Then I went uh, sent up to um, Da Nang. That's uh, Command and Control North, usually referred to as CCN. Uh, I was only there for a, a couple of days and I was sent to uh, Fubai. P-H-U-B-A-I, and uh, that was uh, one of the forward operating bases. As well, matter of fact, it was FOB-1. Forward operating bases are usually referred to as FOB-1, 2, 3. And how long were you there? Uh, I spent a year there. Oh, okay. that was, that was, was your home base? That was the home. Right. What was your job or your duties at, at that forward I became part of a reconnaissance team. And what would you do? We ran operations in uh, Laos for the most part in uh, southern North Vietnam. Reconnaissance operations, uh, finding the enemy, seeing what his strength was, tapping his phone lines, uh, sometimes sabotaging uh, his his equipment. Uh, it was it was a world unto itself. I uh, you you'd only be in the uh, field with them um, at most. I mean, you were really heavy if you hit, took twelve people to the field. That was a lot. Usually, it'd be six or eight. Because the idea was to go, not get caught, not get seen, not get found, and stay for you know days at a time, watching for a very, very elusive and a very professional enemy. Uh, they were very. Uh, that's the word I want to use. Uh, no, I can't think of it. But they made use of the camouflage in the jungle that you wouldn't believe. I mean, they were absolutely masters. Now, how would you get to these? Uh, your time when you're going on a mission, would you move by foot or they drop you? In? Heli helicopter. So, you, so you jumped in by helicopter right. with your small team. Right. Wherever you were assigned, you jumped into Laos. Same. It, we didn't parachute in. The para, it was all. It was all. All, all you'd uh, get down, rappel in depending if you had a real small landing zone, 
or a helicopter can't get in, but he can drop ropes and you can just repel right in. So they would drop you and then they would leave then you Then they take and off. And typically how long would you stay in one place? In 65, 66, you could be on the ground for two weeks. Just you uh, and I, team? Just us. And at the time, in 65, 66, you could actually even get resupplied and stay on the ground. By 68, 69, you were a hero if you were on the ground 24 hours. And it was, there were, there were some 80,000 uh, North Vietnamese assigned to do nothing but work on and secure the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And that's what we were looking at. And that's what we were trying to find. So, it would, and they had every possible LZ. They had what we call a trail watchers. And that's all they did was sit by an LZ all day long and wait and see if a SOG team landed there. And if it did, they'd either follow it or they'd run off to the, uh, wherever their main camp was. And you'd wind up with, you know, uh, depending on some situations, as many as 600 people trying to find you. Uh, but because you were so small, you were in danger because you were so small, but because you were so small, it was easy to hide. You could hide in places that people wouldn't look. You know, they'd expect that you know, nobody could be in, in there, uh, but that's, that's where we were. But it changed drastically in the, in the years between 65 and 68, 69, 70. So for your first first year there, um, is that what you did the entire year? How long would you you come back from the from from one of these missions? You, you come back from one target, uh, and you'd be on stand down for a week, ten days before you got another one. So uh, you were pretty regularly. You know, oh, you were regularly going to the field. You were definitely regularly going to the field. Uh, our missions would come out of. Uh, out of Saigon, they'd want to know what's going on in a specific area. Though they have some intelligence that says there's a base camp at uh, in uh, a target at MA14. That all the targets were given code names like that. They were uh, 10 kilometer square areas, and they were called targets. And they were given things like Oscar 8, uh, Sierra 5, Vasho 8. Things like that. Uh, and then you would go there. Yeah. Now, your small team, your specific job was to do what? At first, I was the radio operator, which didn't require just just because I didn't get that job because I was a communication specialist. I got it, you know, because I was the new guy on the block. Right. So I got to carry the radio, which was fine. It, and then after uh, six or seven uh, missions, uh, if there was need, you'd get bumped up to uh, either a um, reconnaissance team leader or the assistant team leader. There were three Americans on each team. The rest were all indigenous. Martin Yards, Chinese Nongs, or Vietnamese. Do you remember any of your team members? Oh, yeah. The Americans? No, not really. It's been so many years I've forgotten names. I can picture faces, but the names aren't, aren't there. Approximately how many missions would you say you went on in that first year? Probably 10, 14, 15. Roughly, that's a rough guess. Were there any memorable experiences from any of those missions? Oh, some of them were pretty hot. There were a lot of them. If you did get found, you were in serious trouble. So even as early as 65, or when was this, 65, 65 66? 66. Oh, yo, you'd get caught. Oh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, you just couldn't help it. Uh, like I said, there were 80,000 uh, people who just sold uh, objective was to uh, guard the Ho Chi Minh Trail and you know keep it camo you know keep roads camouflaged and uh, repair bomb damage oh they were like like ants and you were 
you remember any specific incidents? Well, let's see, I remember when, you know, at least once when just about everybody on the team wound up in an ambush and everybody got, uh, was hit and couldn't move. Uh, do you know where you were? Oh, I know. Could I show you on a map exactly where they were? Um, probably. I could come pretty close. If, I, if it was a topographical map, I could tell you. And were you surprised? Oh, yeah. You're, you're always surprised when, you're, when you get caught. But the one thing that we uh, did was, it's kind of hard to, to explain. We had what was called the prairie fire, was Laos. It was the code word for Laos. A prairie fire emergency was something that a team declared if they were really in a jam, if they had a lot of wounded, if they were surrounded and couldn't move. When you did that, every aircraft that had any fuel capable of getting to you came to you. And I'm, I'm talking, it could be 50, 75 aircraft. And they were all governed by Covey. Covey is a uh, Piper Cub. He's a forward air controller, and he, he controls all these people. And he's your link to the outside world. You talk to him, he'll spot exactly where you are, and he'll call airstrikes all around your position. So you had an awful lot, an awful lot of power. Uh, I mean, as a as a buck sergeant, I commanded more aircraft than a, a general in a division. I commanded them in the sense that I could I could call for them. That um, they would do everything they could do to get you out. However, if they couldn't get you out at the time, you were written off as well. They couldn't get bodies, so you were written off as missing in action in Vietnam. At the time. Uh, we were telling everybody we have no combat soldiers in in Laos or Cambodia. Well, we weren't strictly combat soldiers; it was reconnaissance. But they'd write you off. You keep, at first in '65, '66, we used the uh, old American weapons from World War II. Your uniform had nothing, you know, no patches, nothing on it. You were sterile, no dog tags, none of that. So they could, you know, plausibly deny that you were there. Were there times when you had to call in for help to get uh, oh, you, taken out? Oh, many times. Were there times that they couldn't get you out? No, because I'm here. But there were times when uh, they knew where you were, and you, you could be in a running firefight for days. You know, running, hiding, fighting, uh, especially during the rainy season. It, you'd get put in in a hole in the clouds, and as soon as you get put in, you know, the clouds you know, close in, and you're in a very mountainous area. You know, sometimes you couldn't even see the top of these, uh, these mountains, these hills, and it was all, the jungle was just as, just as thick as could be. You know, like the triple canopy, uh, triple canopy uh, jungle that you know sunlight can't even get through them. Wow. Um, you want to take a break for a minute? We good? All right. Mm -hmm. So after your first year. And you were going out on these missions and coming back to your forward operation base, um, and your tour was over. What did you do? Uh, once that was over, I was sent to the Eighth Special Forces in Panama. And how long did you stay there? Uh, about a year. And what were your duties there? There was the normal special forces uh, operations. We'd, uh, the, the time I spent in Panama was, I probably don't think of the whole year, I might have been there for you know, a total of six weeks. 
we were gone all the time into, into South America, into different countries in South America, working with various indigenous forces there. Some of that's probably still classified. I don't know, but, you know, the, it's kind of like the world knows you're doing things there, but, you know, you don't you, know, exactly. you, you don't know exactly where. I mean, Special Forces is in every country in the world. The, the friendly, unfriendly, there's somebody is, is there watching and, and seeing. That was drastically different than Vietnam. How did that compare for you? Uh, there's still some danger involved. Uh, you know, everybody wasn't, uh, wasn't friendly. Uh, you would definitely run into some unfriendlies when you're working with uh, people from Brazil or where have you. But uh, it wasn't uh, not as intense as uh, as Vietnam, certainly. Now, how long would you be in the field before you'd go back? Oh, you'd be out for months. You know, you'd be working with people for you know three, four, five months. That's uh, well, that's normal. That's that's what was, uh, you know, that's what you were trained for. After your year in Panama, where did you go? I went back, back yeah. to Vietnam. You volunteered for that? Yes. Do you remember the year? That would have been um, the very end, as uh, a matter of fact, like December of uh, 67. Did you go back yeah. to the same base that you were at? It went right back. It, it all exact same place. Same thing. Exact same routine. Yeah. Same routine. Different. Well, it was a little. It, it was a little bit different shortly after I got there because in uh, February of '68 was the Tet Offensive, and uh, that uh, that shook things up a little bit. I bet. How, what difference did you see between your first tour and your second tour? Oh, the di difficulty of staying on the ground. We couldn't, uh, uh, your average stay would be three or four days, where before you were in for 10, 12, 14 days. Uh, and the, the second tour, were these all new people that you were working with? Were any of the yeah. people there from the first time? Oh yeah, there were some Americans there from, from the first time. Some of the guys had stayed, some of them, uh, had come back, you know, gone to other groups and then returned. SOG started in 1962 and was dissolved in 1971, I think. And during those, during that time, there was only maybe 2,500 uh, people rotating through SOG. So there weren't, there wasn't uh, many at all. Were you typical of a SOG? Um person and volunteering to go back? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know anybody who was in SOG who would volunteer to go to a regular Special Forces unit. Yeah, they all, as far as I remember, everybody would come back to SOG. You just, it kind of got in the blood. But the amount of it back by the time '68 rolled around, and especially right before the Tet Offensive, uh, the amount of uh, equipment coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail—I mean, trucks, tanks—they refused to believe that we, they had tanks coming down. We tell them there are tanks coming down here, and they just write it off as, "Oh, that's crap. There's no no way they could get tanks down there," because these people didn't realize what that trail was like. They're picturing a dirt path. Well, that's not the way it was. It, it was there were roads, I mean, literally roads built through the jungle that you couldn't see from the air, that uh, trucks and tanks would roll down. Well, they believed that were, there were tanks there when, uh, and remember when Quezon was going on, right next to that, or right close to it, a couple of kilometers away, was the Special Forces uh, Camp uh, Long Bay. Those guys got pushed out of there when a tank rolled up on top of the communications bunker. So they, that's when they believed, yeah, these guys saw tanks out there like we told you so. 
Did the Ho Chi Minh Trail evolve as the war? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, oh, it was a, it was a piece of it, it was an engineering marvel. I mean, it was just absolutely incredible. Uh, I remember crossing one road three or four times before I realized that it was a road. It was so well camouflaged. They'd, uh, they'd, do, they'd tie tops of trees together so that they, you couldn't see the road from, from a, above from an aircraft. And when a, the trucks were coming by, they'd have long poles that would push the branches out of the way for the trucks to come by. And as soon as the trucks were by, they'd let the branches back down. And you, you couldn't see that road. And it, it was impossible to see it from the air. Even, as I said, just walking, walking across the damn road, uh, you know, three or four times before I realized, hey, this is the road. You know, you'd kick some piece of camouflage and realize it's not a bush, it's just kind of stuck in the ground. It was, it was pretty amazing. Now, all this time that you're spending it with your little team out in the, it's really survival, um, in the jungle, all that training that you had back in special warfare school and advanced mm -hmm. infantry training and major, uh, did that all kick in? Oh at yeah, that time? Did you especially, especially the ranger training. There's no doubt about it that that, uh, I think that training saved my bacon a few times. Did you feel well prepared? Yes, yeah. As I'm sure the, the average infantryman who was sent there probably went through basic, maybe he went through advanced infantry school and got sent right to Vietnam, was pretty much ill-prepared for the, the kind of war that was being fought, where I was never thrown to the wolves, so to speak. I had, as I said, indoctrination for a couple of weeks after I first got there, got to Vietnam. Uh, and, you know, was told how, I was told about the people the average infantryman wasn't getting that. Uh, and that's where we started losing an, a lot, an awful lot of the support of the people. When we sent conventional forces there, they, you know, mistreated the people. Uh, you know, you've seen the pictures, they'd burn a village. Uh, but that's, you know, that's what they, they did. That's what they were trained to do where we were more interested in having the people on our side. Now that's your second tour, right? Right. And then you told me you went back three times. Went back so a third time. So after the second year was over, where did you go? Did you go home where and did you I just come? stayed in Maryland? I think I, I stayed, yeah. I took a 30-day leave, came home, and went back and stayed for about six more months. That would have run me till 1970, mid-70, I guess. I blotted a lot of this out. The dates and times, I'm just not really very good at. Yes, sir. Now, when you went back for the third time, did you go to the exact same place? Again? Oh yeah. Well, I same stayed place? actually. I didn't. I, so you I, just took a I, leave. I, I took a leave and I extended my tour. So you went back and you did more of the same exact same thing. thing. Um, by then the war was pretty hot. What um, you said that, that the special forces, the SAG units, had more interaction with the, the general populace. Um, can you can you relate anything about your interaction? With the, the well, our teams were supposed to be three Americans and nine or twelve indigenous forces, uh, Martin Yards for the most part, Vietnamese or Chinese Nungs. Uh, now, of course, most of them don't speak English, so you're working through an interpreter. Uh, and you got very, very close, very much attached to your people, very much so. Matter of fact, I'll give you a thing I wrote about that. Um, I forgot about that. Um, yeah, your interaction with, uh, especially the Martin Yards, the, the Hill Tribes people, 
you were very close and they were ex extraordinarily loyal to you. I mean, they, many of the time, they could easily have taken off through the woods and left me, but uh, it, th that thought just never, never occurred to them. You must have been a pretty cohesive team and you must have had, had great trust in each uh, other. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Were you uh, usually with the same team? Did they yes. Seem the no, same no. You kept for you for your tour. You'd be at the with the same team. You may uh, have different people coming into the team because if if someone's wounded, you know, with a serious wound, well, obviously they're out for months. You still need the bodies, so you'd have other people coming in. Uh, Usually, I, I think I've in a, in a year out of nine indigenous people on the team, I'd probably go through uh, 15, 15 people total, because you know people coming coming in. Now, was there a team leader, or was it this? You had what was the teams? Americans were the one zero. He's the team leader. The one one, he's the assistant team leader, and the one two, he's the radio operator. And those are the three Americans. Those are the three Americans. And by '68, you didn't have enough Americans to go around for three, so you'd have two, and sometimes you know just one. But uh, even with just one guy out there, you still had trust in the, in the team. Uh, you could communicate. The whole time that you were in the out in the field, I don't you wouldn't, I don't think you'd say ten words to each other. Uh, number one, for quiet, and two, it just wasn't necessary. You could do everything with you know hand signals, and everybody knew how to patrol. The I mean, these guys had been at war for all their lives, you know, since they were kids. So you know, then they knew, they knew the jungle. So you'd rely heavily on them. Now, was your job the entire time you were over there the radio? No, no, no. After uh, six or seven missions, I became the uh, reconnaissance team leader, the one zero. And you remained that. I remained the every. That was it. Whenever I went back, I'd be a team leader. Yeah. So by now, are you still planning on a career in the military? It was changing a little bit towards the uh, very end. Uh, I had gotten engaged and uh, I got married in 71. When did you fit that in? Shortly after I came back the last, uh, for the very last time, the 30-day leave. And I decided not to stay because if I stayed, well, obviously I'd have been gone all over the world. The only, I mean, there was only one base in the at the time at the in the United States where you had special forces. That was Fort Bragg. Now they're in Washington, um, Kentucky, and I think there's a. Some in uh, Colorado, I'm not sure. I think there's a group in Colorado. Were there many casualties in your unit? SOG took about 130% casualties, meaning that everybody, t t on paper, everyone in SOG was wounded at least once. Out of the 2,500 people who went through SOG, there were 500 KIAs. That's, what's that, 20 percent killed in action? And on paper, everybody was wounded. I, I was wounded four to five times. Uh, Can you tell me about which wasn't uh, all that unusual. Uh, there, were, there were guys with more, I know guys with, you know, eight, 10, 12 purple hearts. You know, for me, it was mostly broken bones and shrapnel once I get shot in the shoulder. But uh, I was a shrapnel magnet. If a grenade went off, 
If a, gr a grenade went off anywhere in Laos, I, the, the shrapnel hit me. Well, yeah. can, you, can you describe just at least one of those situations? Uh, one, it's, actually we walked into an ambush and, it's, and the first thing they hit us with was, uh, was a couple of grenades and fortunately they were their grenades, not captured American grenades. And their grenades, you know, weren't near as powerful as ours and they weren't uh, designed uh, to inflict the damage that ours would. And everybody, everybody on the, the team at the time got hit. Three of the guys were hit very badly. The, uh, uh, sister, the, the Vietnamese team leader got shot through both femurs. Both femurs were broken. The point man, a young fellow, uh, Hong, Hong A, got hit in the chest. Uh, an American got hit in the eyes. He, he couldn't see anything. What else did we have? And all I got out of it was uh, shrapnel. But during the firefight, I kept pull pulling magazines out of my pouch and couldn't use them because they had been shot through. And I actually had one grenade that was shot through. So, you know, I've got, I'm carrying like 600 rounds worth of ammo and 300 rounds worth of it is no good because I can't put it, you know, it's been shot up. So that must have been one of the incidents where you called in help? Oh yeah. yeah we, we definitely, uh, Covey Covey, help me, help me. Definitely called for uh, Covey support. Right, so then yeah. you had a shrapnel wound, where did you have to go to the hospital? Uh, no, we went, uh, it was, uh, went to uh, what's called Charlie Medevac. Once we were evacuated out of there, once we you know got a ride out, the the first place they take you if you had wounded was to Charlie Medevac, and that was uh, well you've seen Mash. Mash was elegant compared to Charlie Medevac. It was a bunker in the ground with seven or eight tables on it, and that was an immediate first aid uh, station. They do, you know, uh, real meatball type surgery. You know, sew you up and ship you out if you had serious wounds, ship you out to uh, one of the uh, field hospitals. Now where was, it, was that located? I'm trying to remember, it was not too, too far from, uh, it wasn't too far from Quezon. And I don't really remember exactly where it was, but very it was close to the border. It was up in, well up in Quang Tri province, up in the northern part of South Vietnam. It was probably the furthest, uh, the northernmost um, medical facility. But as I said, you just go there, get patched up, and get sent right to uh, one of the uh, field hospitals within within an hour you were you were on your way to a hospital somewhere I mean, they, and our medics would take care of us anyway I mean, a special forces medic the eighteen months of training that he goes through is incredibly intense Okay. I tell you what, while you Bill, did you receive any medals or citations? Yes. Can you uh, tell me what they were? Yeah, the Purple Hearts, Bronze Star, and the Army Commendation Medal for Valor. Purple hearts, plural, how many did you receive? Five. Five. Wow. How did you get them? By being a shrapnel magnet, partly. Uh, most of them were broken bones and uh, shrapnel with one, one uh, bullet wound in the shoulder. So I'm going to ask you some questions about daily life. And since you had such a variety of experiences, it's going to probably be a little bit different. I'm sure you're... Shoot. 
uh, daily life in Vietnam was probably different than Panama. Um, how did you stay in touch with your family? Letters. So wherever you were, you could, the mail oh, yeah. got through, you got your mail? Oh, yeah. Mail there was no, mail. never any problem with, uh, with mail, no. And what was the food like? Uh, when you were in a base camp, it was you know pretty good food. I mean, you had uh, especially for us when we were at uh, FOB one Fubai, is there was only, geez, there must have been all of thirty of us. That's thirty Americans. That was it. So our food was uh, pretty good. Uh, you know, we had cooks, non-special forces guys who would cook. Uh, and take care of administrative type stuff. There's none of us, nobody in Special Forces is trained how to type. That's about the only thing they don't tell, teach you how to do. So you yeah. had your own cook in your own dining hall when you were Yeah, at, at and, and you also had the club. You gotta have a club. Oh. Yeah, I don't care if you get two guys, you get, one, of them is, one of you is running the club. Oh, so what was your club like? No, oh, it's basic, uh, a basic bar. Is what it was, uh, and you could always get uh, hamburgers or hot dogs, you know, stuff like that there. Well, how big was your base? Maybe Fubai was maybe a hundred and uh, two hundred yards by five hundred yards, I guess. It wasn't big. How many buildings would you say? Ten. Ten, fifteen. you were in base, did, did you have? Regular barracks to sleep in? It was, yeah, we, what we had was, uh, we had taken over an old French uh, post, is what it was. So you had individual rooms uh, set up very much like a motel. Uh, so, and I don't know what the French used them for, but we used them for individual rooms. You'd have uh, one or two guys in a room. Uh, it was nothing. Nothing fancy, far from it, but uh, you know, bunk, mosquito netting. You didn't spend an awful lot of time in there because when you weren't in the field, you were training. You were, you know, training with the, with the team, or hanging out in the club. As a team leader, was it your job to provide the leadership for your group and for oh, you yeah. to train them? Yeah, it was all all up to me to do that. There was no uh, team leaders were. Uh, Team leaders were God, and you, everything. So you couldn't come back from the field and take it easy and let somebody else do the training? No, no, you, so. you train, you worked as a team, you know, you slept pretty close, closely together as a team. Uh, the indigenous members of the team, you know, the Vietnamese, uh, Martin Yards, whatever, they had their own uh, quarters and their own um, you know, uh, messing facilities. Uh, especially the Martin Yats, because their diet was totally, totally different from what uh, the you know lowland Vietnamese would eat. So the food when you were in base was pretty good. It was pretty good, yeah. And what did you eat when you were in the field? We had two kinds of rations. We take what's called lerps. 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 L R R P. That's okay. long range patrol, long range reconnaissance. Patrol rations, yeah, LRRP, and they were they were very much like what the army gets now in MREs, meal ready to eat. It's a it dehydrated food. You just add water, and uh, in in its own packet, it's always it's always cold, of course. But uh, it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad at all. I guess I've I've got the taste buds of a goat, so. You know, anything to me is fine. You wouldn't take sea rations because you'd be leaving cans behind and you'd have to make noise opening up the can. Uh, and the other type of rations we were called indig rations, indigenous rations were um, rice, fish, or some kind of some kind of meat uh, with uh, like a, some kind of uh, seasoning, and for the most part, would take. I always took the indig rations to the field with me. There's a bag of rice, and you could pre uh, 
pre-make it. You, again, you add water to it. It's all dehydrated stuff. And uh, I, you know, that worked out fine for me. I and mean, it, food uh, wasn't a big problem. Did you always have plenty of other supplies that you needed? Oh yes, yeah, we had. We wanted for nothing. Always had enough ammunition. Always. In '65, '66, I'd go to the field with you know 300 rounds. By the time '68, '69 rolls around, I'm going to the field with you know 600 rounds. Did you feel pressure or stress on the job? Oh yeah. <laughs> How did you handle that? Well, a couple of ways, really. Uh, you know, when you were back on, you know, stand down, you'd uh, you'd do a fair amount of drinking, uh, and you'd kind of go to the field as much as possible. Because if you didn't, you kind of lost your edge for going. So you, even though your team may be on stand down for two or three weeks, you may go out strap hanging, that's what they call it, going out with another team, just to uh, kind of just to keep your nerve up. You know, if you, if you stopped going, you started thinking about, you know, holy shit, what am I, you know, this happened the last time. You know, it just, it, you'd stop worrying too much about what could happen out there. Did you often do that, go out with other teams sure. in between? Sure. Oh, yeah. And we had what was called uh, hatchet forces, where the recon teams were designed to be put in the field without being caught. You know, and without you didn't go out, and the recon team didn't go out to ambush the enemy. The hatchet forces which were platoon and company sized, that's what they did. They went out, they were looking for trouble. They were looking to, uh, to attack. And every once in a while, the, uh, a, a recon team would go with them and act as the point for that, uh, for that hatchet force. Uh, and that happened, I, I did that uh, six, seven times, I guess. Was there anything that you did for special for good luck? No, I wasn't particularly superstitious, except uh, I had a deference to the indigenous population. We'd never go to the field with an odd number of people. The uh, Orientals are very uh, superstitious, and they're like seven. You never go to the field with seven people. That, that one number in particular is... Uh, I don't know, a bad omen, but we'd always go with an even number of people. What did you do for entertainment? Oh, entertainment. Did you have it? We had, we, had, we, had, yeah, we had movies back in base camp. You'd have movies, sure. The, the, the Vietnamese loved the movies. I mean, they just... Even if they were in English? Oh, they could, oh yeah, they couldn't understand a word. But you, you know, give them a Western. Oh, that's what they used to call themselves. They used to call themselves cowboys. And that you know, they loved. Oh hell yeah! They, they, their whole idea of the United States was John Wayne in a western. That was. The, they figured that was. That's what it was like in uh, in the states. Did you have any other kind of entertainment? We wouldn't have them, but you know, usually there was a USO show. Somebody would have one uh, not too far away from us in Fubai was uh, um, a base camp for the 101st. And uh, there was a, a field hospital within a mile of us, you know, so sometimes they'd have uh, a USO show and we'd definitely go to that. Did you get to see any USO shows? No. I one, just, all that time. All that time I, I mean, they weren't there all the time. Yeah. It just, uh, I guess, happened that I was either on my way out or just on my way back from uh, from a target somewhere. Any other forms of entertainment? No, no. 
We were just having so much fun. Oh, we were having so much fun going to the field. Did you have leave at all while you were? In yeah, the one of the things we used to be able to do when you were on stand down was you could uh, take an in country R and R. You go down to whatever the closest Air Force base was, and hop on a plane going to uh, like Natrang. Was Natrang at one point, or still is, called the uh, Paris of the Orient. It's right on the beach. It's got beautiful, beautiful beaches, beautiful water. You could take you know a couple of days, get down to Natrang or. Saigon never attracted me. It was just too. Saigon was just one big, noisy, dusty, dirty city, and it was hot down there. So I never, I never thought about going down there. But I'd go to the train every once in a while. Were your leaves only the short R and R leaves? Yeah, I took one leave uh, in. Let's see, around, it was in '68. I went to Japan. For uh, that was a seven day R and R. Do you recall any particularly humorous or unusual events? Eh, nothing really. I remember one time though, it's it, it, it's humorous in a macabre sense, but. One of the things that we used to have to do was we'd try to get a prisoner. And the uh, easiest way to do that was either wound somebody or another way is you know, we had an M79 grenade launcher. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's, it's got a great big shell. You, anyway, one of, the, one of the shells that comes with that is a tear gas shell. It's a, about that long. It's plastic. And it's got tear gas powder in it. And this one time we saw uh, North Vietnamese leaning against the tree. It was about, oh, 20, 30 yards away from us, I guess. And I warned him as a prisoner. And I told the M79 guy to hit the tree right over his head that would have covered this guy in uh, tear gas powder. Now, my M79 guy could put a round, you know, he could hit a, uh, a watermelon at 200 yards with this thing. Well, the round goes out very slowly, uh, slow enough that you can, you can see it going. And I watched that damn round go and hit this guy square in the head. And his head just kind of went, it, it, it kind of like expanded on it in, in its own skin and went, because it killed the guy. I want, and that's what I want to do with my M79 guy. Is I wanted to kill him for doing that. Is you know we could have had this guy. And every time you got a prisoner, you know, you'd get an, an out of country R and I go to Thailand uh, on the Thailand or Taiwan. I wanted to smack him. He knew what he was doing. He just didn't feel like lugging this guy around. Did you visit any other places while you were in the service? Uh, I, a lot of places in South America, uh, Ethiopia, well, they weren't visits, they were assignments. But you'd, you, know, you got to see a side of uh, countries that uh, most people wouldn't see. You know, it, not the, uh, certainly not the tourist places. The places we were were not touristy. Extremely dedicated, professional, courageous. Did you keep a diary at all? No. Do you have any photographs? I had tons of photographs. And I watched the, the last, it would have been within three days of my leaving for the last time. I had a trunk load of it. Of paperwork and photographs, film, and I watched the Chinook helicopter take off, and I watched the Chinook helicopter crash, 
and burned up everything I had, and I had a ton of stuff. I had pictures of the NBA in Laos, uh, you know, pictures of the guys. I had all kinds of stuff. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Um, did you form any close friendships while you were in the service? Oh, yeah. Did you maintain any of those friendships afterwards? No. No, everybody was kind of scattered to the, you know, the four winds. Uh, there's one guy, uh, Mike Krup Krupchuk, he's up in, uh, he's a cop in, uh, where is he, Ohio. Uh, I have contact with him every once in a while, you know, email type stuff. Was he one of uh, your team members? No, no, he, has, he was on a different team. I, we, we had gone out once together, but he was on a different team. Did different teams get together? Oh yeah, we all lived. You know, we all lived together. Uh, when you were back in base camp, Ollie and Didge would get, you know, get together, and you know, the guys, the uh, Americans would be together. So oh, you all knew each oh, everybody knew everybody. Yeah. I'll tell you an interesting, two, two interesting people who were there with me. One was a guy named Freddie Irons. He was an Oklahoma Indian worth about $20 million, oil money. The day he was born, he got a million dollars. Every year on his birthday until he was 21, he got a million dollars. And I guess when he was 21, he had an option of either taking something like a $50 million buyout or continue to get a uh, million dollars every year on his birthday. Now, and he volunteered for the Army for airborne, for special forces, for SOG, for SOG recon, and you know, he he didn't have to. He was an he's an American Indian. He couldn't even be drafted. And the other person was John Walton, Walmart son. And John did the same thing. He was only worth, I think he was only worth about eleven billion dollars when I knew him, and he just got killed uh, about a year and a half ago in a, in a hang gliding accident. And then he was worth about $22 billion. He was like the, the next heir for the, salt, uh, the, for the Walmart uh, empire. And both of these guys, you know, multi-millionaires. That just give you a little idea of the diversity of uh, people uh, in, uh, in, in SOG, in Special Forces, too. Right now, when your th third tour ended and you were leaving Vietnam to come home, can you, do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Can you describe what that was Yeah, like? it was, uh, it was bittersweet. I, you know, I knew I was leaving with, for the last time. Yeah, I was missing the people. Was that going to be the end of your military service as well as leaving? I had about six months left the last time I came back and uh, was sent to uh, the 10th Special Forces at Fort Devens in Massachusetts. That's where you served your last? That's when my last six months was there. What did you do while you were there? Got married, which was the prime reason I left, uh, left the military. What did you do for a job while you were at Fort Downs? Uh, I was a communication specialist for you know, one of the uh, A teams. You're not going and, out and, in the field, it had to be a lot different. Oh, we went out in the field. As a matter of fact, we spent uh, almost two months in, uh, in Greenland. Doing what? A, a field training exercise, you know, winter survival kind of thing. And, for the entire seven years I was in the military, I was always in a tropical or a subtropic zone. So what do they do for my last six months? Send me to Greenland. I had the best hand in the place. Do you recall the last day in service? Yeah, vaguely. So you were discharged from Fort Devens? Fort Devens. Do you remember the month and year? I don't remember what month though. I think it was a February of 
71, I think. What did you do in the days and weeks immediately after your discharge? I went to work for a, a friend of mine who ran a construction uh, outfit. I worked for him for about six months, and then I went to uh, went to school. Did you go to school on the GI Bill? Yeah. What kind of school? Uh, Westfield State in Westfield, Massachusetts. What did you go to school for? History. You were a history major, or you were to teach history? Well, I thought it was going to be both, but it was just a history major. Did you go back to your hometown in Lowell? No, nope. Uh, matter of fact, uh, I moved to the western part of the state, out you know, in the Westfield area. What did you do after uh, going to Westfield? I went to work for uh, what's called the General Adjustment Bureau, an insurance adjusting company. And how long did you work with them? Uh, three or four years. Then what did you do? Then I became a policeman in East Lyme, Connecticut. And how long did you do that? Uh, about ten years. Then what did you do? Then I moved down south, lived down there, down in uh, South Carolina for five or six years. Loved it down there. I loved it and I hated it. I lived uh, first uh, right on a lake, Lake Marion. Do you ever drive down to South uh, to Florida? No. I've never gone down 95 to Florida. No. Anyway, it's a big lake that you'll cross in South Carolina. I used to live right on that lake. I loved it, crazy about it. And then I let a girlfriend talk me into selling the house and moving to Beaufort. That's on the coast, uh, right near. Um, Hilton Head, hated it, hated everything about it, hated ev everything from the dirt up, including the people, couldn't stand it. And uh, anyway, things happened there and I wound up in, uh, after I left South Carolina, I, I wound up in a VA hospital in uh, Johnson City, Tennessee. And after that, I uh, came up to where I am now at the uh, VA in uh, Connecticut. Connecticut. Did you join any veterans organizations? No. At the time that I came back, you know, uh, you couldn't join the VFW. They didn't consider that a war. They didn't consider Vietnam a war. And that, that, I think a lot of veterans coming back from uh, Vietnam found that to be true. Have you attended any reunions? Yes. How many? Just one. We had a, about three years ago a SOG reunion. We, they have one every year in uh, Las Vegas. It's always in Las Vegas? It's always in Las Vegas. And you went to one of them? I went to what one. What was that like? It was interesting, I mean, uh, seeing some of these guys, you know, overweight, bald, old, you know, and I'm picturing, you know, 20, 21 year old guys. It's, we've gotten thicker and thinner. Do they have a reunion every year? Yeah, everybody doesn't go to the reunion every year, but uh, every year we have, uh, have a reunion, yeah. And, um, in October. Yeah, October. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Yes. In what way? Positively. It's definitely the time I spent uh, in Vietnam is very defining. The entire time in the military was. How did your service and your military experiences affect your life? Well, the PTSD really got to me. I started drinking a lot after, after I got out, started having nightmares, 
But of course, at the time that I got out, nobody knew anything about PTSD. And it was 10 years later before anybody even coined the term. Is there anything else that you'd like to add that we haven't covered, Bill, in this interview? Any other stories, incidents? No, I don't think so. I think we've done well. Well, I'd like to thank you for the interview. I'd like to thank you for your service. No problem. It was my pleasure.